Oh, howdy all, grab yourselves a beer, it is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Today I wanted to answer some frequently asked questions that I've seen on Reddit today about the Heist League. Uh, now if you haven't seen the official announcement of the Heist League, I have linked it below. I've also done my first impressions video, which was a fairly long video in which I went through all of the released information, all of the sort of initial batch of information that was released 12 or so hours ago. Uh, and discuss things in quite a bit of depth. Uh, if you want to watch a long form review of the whole league announcement, then I'll link that as well. Uh, if you don't have that much time and you just want to quickly have a look at the official announcement, uh, that's linked below. And I would suggest doing that before watching this video. So some of the questions have been asked a lot on Reddit today. Firstly, is this going to be another super complex system like Betrayal? Now, my opinion, and keep in mind, I haven't actually played with this system, but I have re reviewed all of the publicly released information about it. I think that this looks more on the complexity level of incursion. In particular, there's no way to permanently uh, damage your setup like there is with Betrayal. So with Betrayal, if you run the Mastermind Encounter, you basically crangle your entire Syndicate board after doing so, and it's a huge setback to your ability to re-engage with the Betrayal content. Generally speaking, it will take you about 50 Jun missions to set up a perfect betrayal board and running, at, maybe more than 50 actually, and running a single mastermind fight will crangle that completely, ruining all the work you put in and just doesn't have the rewards that pay off for that. The way that the, uh, that the high system works is that there's no whole of league consequences for mistakes that you can make. The worst you can do is ruin your next grand heist. So you have heists that you will run and they will build up to a grand heist. Uh, but generally speaking, you should expect to be running about one grand heist per maybe 10 to 15 normal heists that you run, and you should expect to get access to about one heist per zone that you do. So based on that, think of this as being like the way that incursions build up to a temple. Then after you run the temple, uh, it resets and you've got a clean slate for your next one. So if you make monumental mistakes in your first one, uh, they won't stick with you. Uh, again, very different to the betrayal system and much more like incursion. Second question, how do I get into heist? So you will have random drops of contracts from monsters anywhere in the game with the possible exception of maybe some of the very first areas in Act 1. Uh, these are essentially maps, but they're a new type of map. Uh, instead of the map device, they, they're then accessed by using the rogues, the rogue town. Uh, you will also acquire a new type of essentially portal scroll that will take you to the rogue's hideout. And the rogue's hideout will then have uh, the ability to spend a bulk amount of these new types of portal scrolls uh, in order to purchase more contracts. So think of that as being like Zana's, uh, Zana's daily maps that she sells. And contracts are essentially map-esque items that can be crafted the same way that maps can. Maybe with the exception of cartographers, chisels and Varlobs, we'll have to test that out in game. And you can bet your bottom dollar I will be throwing a Varlob on a contract at some point on day one of the league. So. Is stealth mandatory? And related to that, can summoners participate in the content? Uh, no, stealth is intended as an option that most players won't take, but that will be viable for beating the, con uh, the content. On the flip side, of course, if you're on a Necromancer build, stealth is impossible because your minions will, will generate lots of aggro. Uh, but the concept of running things through stealth, many people may remember the old Verici missions. So prior to the Betrayal update, uh, 3.5 some time ago, I think it's like 18 months or so ago now, uh, betra before Betrayal, there, the various masters, many of whom are now members of the Syndicate, would have missions that they would give you daily, and sometimes you'd find them in a map as well. And Verici was infamous, where he would tell you to go and kill a particular rogue exile, so when you talk to Verici, he would spawn a rogue exile in your map, and he would also spawn a bunch of guards around them. And sometimes he would give you a mission where he said, Kill the, ro kill the rogue exile, but kill none of the guards. And other times he'd give you a mission where it would be kill the rogue exile, but leave at least one guard alive. These missions were notoriously difficult and required strategies that were very different to normal Path of Exile gameplay. It all be done. Uh, in, and, you know, like I played on builds that had uncontrolled chains at various times and succeeded at those missions. Uh, in the Incursion League, I leveled Verici up to eight and I was playing a Deadeye with automatic chaining. But whenever I wanted to get a Verici mission to succeed, my approach would always be to 
run in uh, to aggro monsters and then basically body pill the rogue exile out. I would ascertain, are the guards faster than the exile or is the exile faster than the guards? Uh, and if the exile was faster than the guards, I'd run a long way away. Uh, if the guards were faster than the exile, I'd still run a long way away, but then I'd run back and pick up the guard and kill, uh, sorry, kill, kill, pick up the exile and kill him. Uh, this type of gameplay, I, I found it interesting. Uh, many other people didn't agree and it wasn't ended up, it didn't end up remaining in the game after they did the betrayal changes. However, that is not going to be what these heists are going to be like. Uh, they're going to be something quite different to that. The stealth will be optional and it might sometimes let you pick up one or two more items in there. Because one of the key things that happens here is that, and this leads into my next question, do monster kills call me to, uh, cause me to fail the stealth phase? Uh, no, they do not. In general, monster kills very slightly increment the alert, uh, the alert timer. What really increments it a lot is opening up new treasure chests. So if you open up a treasure chest, you might base, uh, you might end up having eight times the effect that you would have if you kill a monster. Uh, and so as a result, it's not so much about the monsters you kill, although you might con conceivably be able to squeeze out one more item if you kill absolutely nothing. Uh, next question is, why is no one else on Reddit excited about the Chains of Emancipation chain belt? And the answer is, I don't know. This thing is bonkers. Uh, this thing is possibly one of the most powerful unique items that's been added to the game in a long time. And I really don't know why people aren't going sort of gaga over it. Uh, basically, I think this is just absolutely incredible. Uh, it, it's similar power, it's similar in power level to Headhunter but as an anti-boss item rather than as an anti-trash item. The way Headhunter is incredible when you're doing trash clearing. Uh, Chains of Emancipation is going to be absolutely incredible in conjunction with a warding flask for boss killing. And I really do not understand why people are not looking at this and going, oh my god, this is the best unique item in a very, very long time. Especially given that it's got this terrible implicit, but you can always crangle that off. Uh, you know, that's, that's what corruption chambers are for. So, the next thing that I wanted to quickly raise is the question of the supporter packs. Uh, is this it? And unfortunately here I have to be the bearer of bad news. Currently, yes, this is all that is in the supporter packs. So, they have this, uh, these kind of cool character effects, these quite good armor kits, uh, and plus some of the little nifnaf and trivia like the, uh, like there's these, um, what do they even call these things? Portrait frames. Uh, but that appears to basically be all that's in them at the moment. Uh, I think these new character effects are awesome, uh, but I think also that the packs need more than them. These are not the Jesus feature that's going to sell a supporter pack on its own. Uh, they are something that's a welcome addition to an otherwise good pack. I really like the Master Spellblade supporter aesthetic in general, and I know there are people who like the Imperial Eagle supporter aesthetic as well. It's not so much my style, but it is kind of good. Uh, I really like these character effects, but I still feel that these are missing something. And what I want to suggest to GGG is that they should add hideouts to these, but on a new basis. So previously, all uh, microtransactions included in supporter packs have been supporter pack exclusives. What I want to suggest is that they have them on a basis where they're timed exclusives instead. If you buy the supporter pack, you get the hideout as soon as it's ready. If you don't buy the supporter pack, you can then later pick up the, uh, the hideout in the normal uh, point store at a later point. Uh, you can just trade for it, or you can just buy it from the microtransaction store later. Uh, probably at a price point of like 300 points, uh, 300 store points. I think that'd be something that would both make these feel like better value propositions, but also hideouts sell. People like hideouts from the microtransaction store. Uh, and I think the eventual point-based sales of these hideouts will pay for all the development and art time that goes into them, and then GGG can just reap the rewards from the additional sales of the supporter packs. Uh, last question I wanted to raise, uh, wanted to bring up is the Triska Decadophobia divination card, which uh, I'm really quite hyped to turn in sets of this and die horribly on some of the, some of the maps that come out of it. Uh, what do I think this is going to trade for? Because this has been a bit of a point of contention on the thread where the designer, of, or where the person who commissioned the divination card uh, post about it, and a couple of people thought, "Oh, yeah, this doesn't, this isn't interesting to me," which is fine. Like, uh, this is going to be a bad card if you're a solo self-found player. I don't think you're going to be able to to complete a set of it. Uh, it's not for everyone, but 
I'm going to go out and make a prediction that this card is going to be worth a Divine Orb all league. So from day one of the league, uh, when Divine Orbs are cheap, you know, four chaos or so, you'll be able to pick up a Triskaidekaphobia for about that price. Uh, by the middle of the league, when Divine Orbs are sort of around 12, 15 chaos, this Divination card will go up to that price as well. Uh, the reason I say that is that tier 13, like being three tiers lower than the maximum, doesn't actually matter all that much on Delirious maps. Uh, it's more about the volume of loot that you're dropping than the actual monster level that, that it's sourced from. So for that reason, uh, and also the 13 quality, people have been saying, oh, that's so much less than 35 that you'd have on a Fractured map. But Fractured maps will never have eight modifiers. They have four modifiers uh, two-thirds of the time, they have five modifiers one-quarter of the time, and they have six modifiers one-twelfth of the time. Every single modifier that you can possibly roll has at least 10% uh, increased item quantity, uh, which is equivalent to quality, and also at least 4% to monster pack size. So with all of this in mind, uh, actually going from 13 quality to 35 quality is only about equivalent to one map mod. Uh, and as a result, I think that this, that Triskaidekaphobia sourced maps, they won't be quite as good as a Fractured Fossil sourced map, but they will be very close to it. And as a result, I'm going to predict that this Divination card is going to be worth a single Divine Orb pretty much at all phases of the league, so 13 Divine Orbs for a full set. Anyways, going to leave it there. If you've got any comments or questions, fire away below. Otherwise, I hope you have a good one.